the Sustainability Management Master's program, you're answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. At the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. Well, I'm impressed of the reception that you have and how many students participate in the seminar today. And then I realized it was all due to the Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> and the coffee. It's primarily because of you. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. So I want to thank Samir for handling all the logistics. I want to thank Dibs for inviting me. I want to thank Ninzu, who's not here, uh, probably working on one of our projects. Um, so it is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, before I get started, though, uh, talking about our topic, how many folks, I asked this when we were doing a little meet and greet, how many folks have been to Alaska? I know one. Two. What part? I went a long time ago. Uh, there, was a, there was more of a cruise around. Everybody does the cruise. Okay. <laughs> we are not going to be talking about the cruise area today. So, okay. Um, but uh, one more thing, I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, there's uh, three people uh, that have been involved, including a professor at UAA. So Dr. Ken Duffy is watching the webinar, and it's really Dr. Ken Duffy, a marine oceanographer from our Baton Rouge office, that is, very, is the lead scientist on the research we're doing up in Alaska. So I really want to give a shout out to Ken uh, for helping me pull this together. And of course, really, it's a, a result of his work and the work of Dr. Tom Ravens, of the University of Alaska at Anchorage. Uh, so I, I had a chance to meet a number of you. I realize we have a diverse number of academic disciplines represented here. So I'm going to pull back the talk and not delve into specifically process modeling or design. I'm going to try and talk a little bit of more of this from a sustainability. Uh, how do you make logical decisions on where you invest in infrastructure? We will get a little geeky here and there. There will be a little calculus. There will be a test at the end of the program. Uh, but we'll stay kind of light uh, on it. So uh, yeah, working in Alaska is fascinating. It's one of the enjoyments of running a, a small business. You do get a chance to decide where you might want to work. Uh, and Alaska is a real. Uh, a draw for a number of our employees. Not all of our employees. Some of them would prefer not to go. But for those with a, a spirit of adventure, uh, Alaska's got a lot to offer. And this part of Alaska that we're going to be talking about, this is the North Slope. That's the Arctic Ocean. Point Barrow, that is the furthest northernmost point in North America. After that, it's just the North Pole. So that's about 180 miles, 200 miles north of uh, the Arctic Circle. And we're up there uh, quite a bit at these locations. We're mainly going to be talking about Aliktok and Point Lonely, but we've done work at all of these and have done uh, research. And UAA has done a lot of research at Drew Point. But we couldn't do an Alaska presentation without first getting to the animals, right? We need a little bit of wildlife to, dr to draw the crowds in. <laughs> so this is a humpback whale. Uh, a lot of whales up there, a lot of orcas up there. Uh, I am a big fan of the muskox. I just think they're primeval. And our folks, so I'm a guy who's been up to Alaska a hundred times. I've not seen a polar bear in the wild. So I'm going to stay out of Vegas. So, but we go, so that's a boneyard. So when the local Inuit native villages do their allowed whale hunting every year, they're usually allowed per village about 20, 25 whales. 
they'll leave a certain amount of meat and all the bone and the carcass on there and the polar bears will come in and feed on it. It's called the bone yard. So that's, I think, at Barter, Barter Island or in that village, Kaktovik. Uh, and it's amazing. And all of our employees, except me, who work up there, have seen their polar bear. So a uh, little history in order to get into this project. Uh, does anybody know the World War II history with the dew line is? Is the dew line even familiar to anybody? No, I could. No, no. Well, they're not encroaching on, on that. Uh, so when World War II was uh, underway and after World War II, when the Cold War started, uh, America and Canada built a number of short and long range radar installations extending from in the west from the Bering Strait all the way to Newfoundland in the east. Hundreds of facilities. A lot of these have since become uh, abandoned, demolished, and removed, but a number of them are operating. We're going to be talking about some operating ones. But you, it's amazing to think about all the infrastructure our Defense Department has built north of the Arctic Circle. So we're going to zoom in on a Lictoc. That's the cover that you saw. And we're going to go in a little bit closer, and that's what a radar facility looks like from a plan view. It's basically a radome, large raynut that looks like that golf ball, uh, maintenance facilities. There's always an airstrip. There's usually a number of docks, warehouses, and support facilities. This is considered critical infrastructure by our Department of Defense. And of course, with the geopolitics in the world, with North Korea, China, and Russia, there's a lot of sensitivity. This is operated by the Pacific Air Force. You might hear me refer to PACF. So this is a, this is a very important series, uh, a series, a number of installations throughout the Arctic, and we're involved with environmental work on most of them. So now I'm going to talk about how we got involved with coastal erosion. Oh, there's the facility, a little bit better picture. So there's the, the golf ball. Every radar facility has one. Uh, as you can see, I don't have a pointer here, but Keep an eye, we're going to be talking. Uh, uh, so keep an eye on these bags. These are some older erosion protection bags that were used to prevent erosion back a few years ago that were put in place, and they've not done their job. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later on. So. Um, much of our research is being done at Electoc. This is the main radar facility we're going to be talking about. But when we were first starting to work, we were hard, we mainly do environmental cleanup work uh, at these DOD facilities. So we were given a contract called performance-based remediation. It's really not important what it was. It was there to clean up and demolish a number of facilities. We were there to demolish two abandon radar facilities and clean up to others. This is mainly petroleum, petroleum oil and lubricating oils, PCBs, heavy metals, uh, take down tanks. Uh, nothing too sexy, if you'd want to say. Uh, but while we were out there, we have to bring barges in, right? There's no roads that go into these facilities, at least not most of them. It's either by barge or by plane. And we're starting to notice our geologists and engineers are noticing these large blocks falling into the ocean. And we're having trouble unloading and getting our stuff on and off the facility. We have a lot of equipment, a lot of construction equipment to bring on and materials to bring off, and it turns out that the barges can't land. The dock's no longer there, the pier's no longer there, or they're shoaling and sediment accreting in areas that they've never seen before. So our very capable GIS folks start mapping some shorelines over time. And what they start noticing is over the past 20 years and the past 10 years, there's been a tremendous loss of shoreline. So as you can see, you have, we were supposed to clean up this drum storage area. You can see in the upper left corner. And in 2006, you could see where the shoreline was eight years later. Now we had already bid the job in 2013 based on a certain sense of where the site was going to be and where the shoreline was going to be. And as you can see in the lower right-hand corner, the drum storage area has since been deposited into the ocean. It is no longer even there. So even landfills were now eroding away. And of course, the Alaska DEC was getting very concerned. 
because the contaminated sites, which had not yet been remediated, were now going from being a land-based problem to a marine-based problem. And they were going to the Air Force saying, hey, guys, we have an issue here. Uh, you've got contamination going into the ocean. So this became a big priority. So we called up and said, Air Force, we have a problem. This is not, you know, contamination may be a problem, but you may have a risk to your assets. And they listened. They listen very attentively. Actually, it's one way to get the military's attention is to know when it's a real threat to their physical assets, their physical plant. Then you get a lot of attention. So this is a main point I want to bring out. We, we approach them uh, very logically. And like I said, you might not all be interested or with doing environmental work in Alaska, but what's important to engineers today, what agencies are looking for is logic and, and a stepwise process to how you're going to get to a solution. We uh, assess the problem. We, we finished phase one, and I'm going to talk about that, about two years ago and realized that the way that the problem was being studied was not sufficiently robust or accurate. So we proposed a model. We're in the middle of the modeling phase now. And then we intend to go into the alternative engineering analysis. Essentially, what will be the greatest return on investment for the Air Force in terms of years of protection versus the cost that, they, that it's going to take to get that protection based on the risk that the modeling is presenting? And then ultimately build. These are very expensive places to build. And the Air Force bought into this phased approach. So we're done with phase one, we're in the middle of phase two, and we'll probably start phase three within about six to nine months. And I'm going to be talking about phases one through three, assessing the problem. So yes, is there a problem? And was the Air Force convinced that there was a problem? But what were the techniques available to predict the erosion? How accurate would that be? I mean, these are making big decisions. Am I going to lose the radar dome in 10 years or 50 years or 100 years? Uh, do I need to worry about it when I'm the commander now? Or can the commander who's going to take over the installation worry about it down the road? And then how can this process be applied to other facilities and other agencies? They all have the same issues, BLM, Fish and Wildlife, Corps of Engineers. So you try to provide standardization. The, the federal government likes standardization. They don't like to do one-offs. They like to have a standard approach to assessing a problem. So the, what we did is we did some homework. Well, who studied this? The Corps of Engineers is really the, it's the country's, it's the federal government civil engineer. That's their sobriquet. That's what they're known for. So we, we studied their, their 2009 report. But how they had assessed the risk in coastal Alaska was using linear regression. I don't think I need to explain linear regression to this capable group. Uh, but you all know they're applying an equal amount of weight to historical trend data. And in a period of climate change, that's a no-no. That just won't work because it's an accelerating nonlinear uh, mechanism. So this is called uh, the death spiral. So this is the Arctic Circle looking down, and this each represents a month. And as you follow it over time, I know it's a bit busy if you're not used to studying it, but essentially it's meant to have the dramatic effect of showing that over time, even during the winter months, we are losing large volumes of Arctic ice. There are periods of time, as you might be hearing, there are, there are points that they can now travel the entire way through the, quote, the Northwest Passage from the East Coast to the West Coast. And that's something the Russians very much want to be able to do. Uh, there's a lot of data out there, but there's a prediction that by 2050 to 2060, there will no longer be a total ice pack in the Arctic. That is a dramatic statement for something that's been around for tens of thousands of years. And it has, it has economic consequences, it has geopolitical consequences, and for the Inuit and for the native community, of which there's hundreds of thousands of people, a real quality of life, a survivability impact. So it's quite dramatic. And that's what makes working up there, frankly, impressive and cool. And, and as I was sharing in the, in the icebreaker, the, uh, you, know, you, study coast, you study climate change in Louisiana or in New Jersey after Sandy, 
you see impacts of a few feet. You go up there and you see it real time, very dramatically. Okay, this is a, a, key, a key way of trying to understand the major mechanisms that are going on, and that's what makes the modeling uh, complicated, challenging to do. You have a number of variables, a number of driving uh, climate drivers that are affecting why erosion is happening. And the truth is, the one that you hear about in climate change in the lower 48 is sea level rise. Well, sea level rise has a negligible impact on erosion in Alaska. There's almost no sea level rise happening in the Arctic or in the west, west part of Alaska. It's mainly due to these five factors. We are getting much warmer shore waters. We are getting warmer atmospheric temperatures. We are getting a lengthening of open water periods. Again, that death spiral. So you think about that, you've got warmer air, warmer water, longer period with no ice formation. And the amount and the spatial extent of open water is greater. Well, you put all that together, what do you get? You've got increasing wind speed, hence increasing wave action, increasing wave energy over much longer periods of time. And then lastly, you've got permafrost, which doesn't exist in the lower 48, but is a substantial part of the lithology of Alaska, is especially in the northern part, is permafrost which is basically ice and soil together, or almost solid ice, but it's mainly soil and ice together. Uh, so, th and these factors all feed on each other because uh, the water temperature is not increasing linearly, Th the water temperature is not, and therefore it's having, and you're now having this, not, this ice barrier that used to protect the shore no longer forming, and you have therefore wave action pounding the shoreline for longer periods of time at greater energy, greater wave height. This brings it home a, a little bit differently, but it's, it's meant to illustrate the point. You've got a decreasing amount of ice extent that used to form, but what the plot shows is over time for the month of August, you have decreasing the RCP, the blue line, is the decreasing ice fraction. It's the ice concentration in that part of the world, in the, 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 North, in the Arctic, and the corresponding increase in wind speeds, I mean, in, in wind speed, which again is an indirect measurement of what your wave height will be. So you can see the very dramatic drop in ice fraction and the increasing speed of wind, which will directly correlate later on in the modeling we've done to create much greater wave energy being impounded for a longer period of time. So we did a, we did a quick uh, sort of analysis using the linear analysis, the linear data, and then took historical data from the 60s, 70s, a lot of GIS measurements, Landsat me measurements, and realized that the, the linear uh, regression analysis did not at all match reality. So we started to apply nonlinear techniques to the data and saw a much better fit to the data. And again, it makes sense. These trends are all occurring much more recently and having a greater impact, so we have to give greater weight to the more recent time periods. This is obviously to a smart group like this, not rocket science, but you'd be surprised how much it doesn't inform policy and the way decisions are made and the way people build things. Uh, people have a fascination with it, looking at historical data and thinking the past is prologue to the future. In a time of climate change, that is not the case. All right, so this gets a little wonky, but I thought it was important, again, especially for the environmental management folks. How do you make decisions? Where do you spend money? You've got a lot of facilities up there. So some, this is a basic USDOT approach, and we applied it to the DOD, and it was pretty, we basically looked at the critical assets. There's hundreds of assets at these facilities, and we sat with the, the client, and we said, okay, you got a radar dome, you got an airstrip, you got a warehouse. They're not all critical, so we put weights on what are the most critical assets on each of these three facilities, the ones that were considered most at risk. We then looked at how vulnerable they are. So we looked at each time period, and based on just the nonlinear technique, we applied a vulnerability score if an asset was going to be impacted in the next 10 years or the next 20 and the next 30. So 
nothing very fancy, but very logical. How critical is an asset? How vulnerable it is, is it to likely to be impacted by an event, in this case, erosion? And we try to quantify that and put it in a risk score. Uh, again, this comes out of a US DOT methodology, but it's a nice way for a commander to look and say, oh, okay, my facilities that score in the red or yellow are clearly more at risk than the facilities that score in the green or the lower scores of the yellow. And at that point, they decided that a LICTOC was uh, the most vulnerable of their, their facilities. Uh, we did want to make one point. I want to go back. This is not a lick talk. This is uh, point lonely. But to point out how we determined that even the statistical techniques were not sufficient. We were doing this in 2014. But notice this. It might be easier if I just point. Uh, this little white looking uh, facility there. That's a storm, storm water outfall facility. It's basically where the people who live on the facility, where the waste gets discharged. It's important. Um, using the nonlinear technique, we expect that facility, that little treatment plant, to be impacted in about 2042. This is where it is in 2015. It's about 30 feet away from the discharge pond being compromised. And this year we were doing field work and the pond is gone. The discharge pond is gone. The treatment plant will be gone by 2020. So again, we've lost another two, 22 years even using the nonlinear technique. So in there you see some of the erosion rates. We projected 70, 30, and 5, and the erosion rates in from, 10, from 2000 to 14 were almost 3 feet per year, and then in two years, in one year, it was averaging 25 feet. Just amazing, the, the, the rapidity up there of the rate of erosion. Remember those sandbags I showed you in the beginning of the, of the picture of a Liktok? You could see how all the scour happened around it. Again, this is based on wave overtopping, but the wave water that's coming over is also warmer water, and therefore it's thawing the ice formation that holds the sediment together, and it washes around. And that's why you saw those long lips around the east and west of it eroding away, those bends in it. And there's the sanitary sewer outfall structure in the circle. So clearly, whatever they had built and designed just a number of years ago were no longer effective at all in mitigating the risk to any of the infrastructure at the, at the plant. So uh, you know, we basically posed a couple of questions. Um, are they adequate for predicting it? We said no. I will tell you the core was not happy. Uh, and then we say, are there better mechanisms to predict what, the, uh, what would, would be the effect of climate change on erosion rates uh, in the near time. And we said the answer must be yes. So we wanted to, we proposed that we assess some models, uh, models that account for processes specific to the Arctic, not that there are many. And we looked at more than a dozen models for their applicability to an Arctic environment. And then we spoke to a number of experts who have worked in the area. We looked at all these models. Uh, does anybody here take hydrologic modeling classes? Hydraulics one? Oh, good, I could say and get away with a lot. No, <laughs> kidding. Uh, but essentially, uh, the Genesis model and the X Beach models are two very popular lower 48 shoreline models. And the models that we ultimately looked at were, were in the Arctic were built uh, using some of the work uh, in the Genesis and the X Beach model. But uh, Dr. Duffy, who I mentioned, put together this matrix to rank, rank and evaluate all the applicable models. And what we came up with was two. And we landed up focusing in on the top one, this one developed by UAA, Dr. Tom Ravens, in the Civil Engineering Department. Uh, mainly because it was very Arctic specific. It was open source. We can get our hands on the data and play with it independent of him. Uh, it did account for climate change, so it did build in uh, changes in temperature, wind speed over time. It was considered reliable. It had been validated at at least one Arctic site. And he had done, he had done this work at Drew Point. 
and, uh, and the, uh, I'm going to move kind of quickly. He had predicted these various erosion rates. Drew Point is only about 120 miles west of the Liktok, so very applicable environment from a geomorphology uh, perspective as well as, of course, being an Arctic location. Again, the inputs he was drawing on were the ones I mentioned were big drivers, uh, nearshore water temperature, wind speed, ice extent, and we'll talk about this bluff and width of collapsing block in just a second. But it was his Drew Point study, a 2007 paper, if I'm not mistaken, subsequently updated to 2012, that made us really choose his work. And then we interviewed him and determined that his model was the most applicable. Uh, we compared his model to the historical linear and nonlinear mechanisms. And it, to us, it, it well outperformed both techniques when we hindcasted his model results to historical time periods, a much better fit. So we went to the Air Force and said, listen, we think we have a better model, uh, and the modeling will certainly be more accurate than the statistical techniques that the Corps has been using and that we've used. It is built, there's two versions of his model. There's a simpler version, uh, which clients like. It has less variables. It's called the semi-empirical model. And then there's a process-based model. Again, I'm going to try and move it along, uh, so I'm not going to cover each bullet on this. You can see some of the variables that the semi-empirical takes into account. And then the process-based model takes into account many more variables. Of course, as all good academicians will attest, more data is always better, and uh, greater simulations is always better. But in the real world, you can't always get your hands on real field data. You have to project and you have to deal with the circumstances that you have. Uh, but the Air Force approved of us to go ahead and develop both models and then see if there was enough of a statistical advantage of the process over the semi-empirical because their goal was not only to model a lick, talk, and barter. Their goal was to come up with a standard model for the entire Arctic environment that the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Air Force could all apply. So that's where we are now. We're developing these two numerical models, mainly UAA is, I should be honest. Our work, our staff is supporting them. Uh, and it takes into account, uh, we're doing this at two locations, Barter Island and Electoc, two of the more at-risk facilities, taking into account a lot of these climate uh, drivers that I mentioned earlier. And again, the ultimate purpose was, was for the models to be used not only to evaluate the current facilities and what they need to do, but if they're going to be siting. As I mentioned, there are these great geopolitical issues going on. There's a lot of assets that the DOD wants to invest and deploy up there. They want to know, are they going to be around in 50 years if they, if they put a $100 million facility up there? These are the two main mechanisms. I'm mainly going to be talking about the niche block method uh, and try to do justice to it, but there's, if you have a beach, there's called thaw slumping. Uh, which there's a more dominant mechanism during milestorms, but during large storm events with large wave heights that go way back is mainly this niche block formation, and I'm going to get into that a little bit. So this is a, a simple schematic cartoon of the process. So unlike what you think of Sandy Hook and your Jersey beaches or North Carolina where you have these nice gradual beaches, in Arctic Alaska, a lot of the shoreline is a bluff, right, an escarpment with very small, narrow beaches. So that when that wave comes up, it pounds the bluff. And what happens is when that, when you have, again, the increasing wave heights with increasing energy, it starts forming a niche, a notch at the base of the bluff. And as that niche grows and grows, then it's just physics. Right? And remember, that bluff is not made out of solid soil or even not, not, of course, bedrock. It's unconsolidated sediments, but it's basically held together by ice crystals. It's an ice aggregate. So now you've got warm water forming this niche, propagating, and then it's creating an opening. And then you have atmospheric temperatures, air permeating through the soil porosity, further melting the interstitial ice that's in the pore spaces. So between the weight of the block above and the erosion of the underlying sediments and ice, you're getting block collapse. So unlike erosion, you know, where you see sand just washing out, you land up, as you see in the bottom, with 
it's it's amazing to see up front to see 60 by 80 foot masses of land just collapse from one year to the next. So that's the main dominant, especially at a lick talk. Okay, so these are all the variables. You can just study that for a second. You can see all the, the, the different variables that dominate this niche block formation. Important ones are the salt concentration because obviously salt affects the melting point of the ice and therefore if you have a higher soil concentration you're lowering the melting point so even if it's below freezing you're still getting melting. Uh, the suspended sediment density is important you know when the when the wave comes up if it's carrying coarse material coarse gray material it's like a projectile going into the shore further eroding it um, and uh, and you can see the poor ice and the poor ice concentration. Some of the formations, some of the bluffs are 70 to 80 percent ice. Some of them are 30 percent. But you think you're looking at land. I think I'll show you a picture in a second. Well, you can almost get it in some of these pictures. Some of those bluffs, that's 70 percent ice that you're looking at. You're not looking at soil. So we, we looked at this process-based model, which built on this X beach models. And what Dr. Ravens will do is synthesize what storms will be like in the future, right? Because storms are getting more intense. There's a big debate in the climate change world about frequency and intensity. It happens in our firm all the time, right, Ken? And uh, speaking into the mic, uh, it's, it's, but one thing for sure is there might not be greater frequency. There is certainly greater intensity, whether it's typhoons in the Pacific, hurricanes coming up from the Caribbean, intensity, and it's really, it's basic physics, right? You're getting greater thermal energy imparted into the atmosphere, you're getting more moisture being sucked up. Obviously, you're going to get greater intensity of events. So you got to simulate that. And then this Kobayashi routine, which is a big part of his model, is when this block erodes, that block all of a sudden becomes a bit of a barrier. It protects against erosion. So now you've got to model separately how long it's going to take that block to erode. We collected a lot of field data. So I'm going to, tr again, try to move through some of these kind of quick. It's a, the, uh, but it is kind of cool doing field work up there. Believe it or not, we prefer doing field work in the winter because you don't damage the tundra. It's not wet. It's not boggy. It's less mosquito-y. Uh, those mosquitoes are like the size of birds. Uh, so we have volunteers. We hire interns. We just had a college intern go up there for a month. She wasn't happy. No, she was fine. She was a trooper. <laughs> hey, you know, what else are you going to say? You could either go down to the Caribbean and have a great time and drink some beers, or you can go to the Arctic and get beaten by large mosquitoes but do great field work. Choose the latter, I'm telling you. But um, so here's all the field work we did, all the information we collected, temperature. The thermistor strings went down anywhere from 15 to 50 feet. So we're taking a long profile of the temperature change over time down at the shore inland because this permafrost this occurs in hundreds thousands of feet this is not right at the shore so we could be losing miles of shoreline miles of shoreline over the next 50 years pictures that's the thermistor string in the middle lower lower middle picture you see the ice core you see the core that's the core well down that's almost solid ice and yet we built structures on top of that. This is that picture I showed you before, those graphs of the wind versus the ice concentration. The reason I'm reproducing it again is if you're building a model, what do you do in an area of the country where you don't have a lot of good field data already collected? This is a, this is a data hungry, a data starved environment. So what you're able to do using this Delft simulation wave nearshore model, the SWAN model, is you could collect wind data, and the wind data could recreate what the wave action would be. And we've been able to, to do that to a fair degree of accuracy. And that's critical. Without good wave data, you're not going to be able to run either the process or the semi-empirical model. This is, again, getting a little wonky, but it's essentially the top modules. So all the models in the process model take, take into account this niche formation. And the top line is strictly the niche if there's no block 
present. If a block is present, you have to run the separate module where it, how long will it take for the block to erode away before you could then rerun the simulation with, without a block being there. So it's important to get that right because the blocks will provide a certain amount of protection, but only for a limited period of time. Well, how much time? That's important. And of course, that sediment will migrate. So where is it going to fall out? Where does it aggregate? You know, does it fall out just a few miles away, or does it go all the way to Russia or Canada? That, believe it or not, that's not a small discussion. Ah, we had to do a little calculus. So at the end of the day, like anything, the, a lot of things we do in chemistry and physics and science, it's all mass balance. So where's the sediment going? So these are two basic equations that take into account a longshore and cross-shore transfer, right? It's either going in and out perpendicular to the beach or it's going parallel to the beach. We have to determine how much sediment is actually passing through the beach, the, the shoreline we're studying, and are we getting a net reduction in sediment migration or a net increase? Are we losing shoreline? Are we losing sediment? Are we aggregating? So the model generates this as an output with, you know, Q being the mass or volume of sediment per unit distance that you're measuring per unit of time. And hence, that'll ultimately to tell you both are you having a net loss of sediment and what is the dominant transport mechanism? Is it parallel to the shore, perpendicular coming out from the wave action, or going lateral and parallel to the shore? So the principal output is uh, for the period. So we don't expect one of the reasons we picked this period of time is, first of all, the further out that you go, the more inaccurate you're going to be. And we need accuracy. The DOD is not used to doing. This is very atypical for the DOD to do this kind of research. They are funding 100% of this project. And they are only doing it because they want to know if their facilities are safe or should they put facilities up there. Uh, without getting into radar technology, because what I know would take about a second to uh, voice, uh, they, they feel that these short, these long-range radar facilities have about another 30 years of useful life where they will then be able to be replaced by more advanced radar technology that could be put much further <coughs> inland. So they, our design life cycle was looking at about 30 years from now to about 2050. Key part two is the sensitivity analysis. If you're going to come up with an engineering design, structural, mechanical, electrical, I remember, get a brownie points for that. Uh, you got to know what variables are dominating, right? It may not be the temperature variable that's dominating. It could be strictly the wave action that's dominant. How you're going to mitigate, the which structure you're going to use to mitigate that risk is going to be based on that dominating factor. So you want to be able to run sensitivity analysis in order to determine the dominant variable that's causing the erosion. And it could be all of them equal weight. But that's part of what we want to tease out of this. At the end, what the Air Force wants is give us shoreline projections that are accurate, that take into account climate change scenarios, although we have to sometimes find alternative wording than the word climate change. That's another story. So now, so that's the science and the modeling part, right? So we applied a lot of good science, some statistics, some modeling to say, here's your problem, here's why you have a problem, here's the mechanism that's causing the problem. So now the engineers take over. So they had to make an assumption, I kind of already spoke about this. Uh, is it posing an immediate risk to the assets and the operations? The answer was yes. And how long should I design for? How long is my mission? Is it right? A bridge is 100 years. Another structure is 50. They gave us a 30-year design life cycle. That was it. By 2050, they're going to have different radar, and we could, we could not worry about this plant coming down. But as you know, the, the facility is already at risk, and it's only 2018. Here's just some pictures of some of the other, the roadway. This is a roadway that's being washed out. Remember, this is, uh, I said to you in the beginning that very few of these facilities have road access. That is true, except for Liktok. It does have a road from Prudhoe Bay. Prudhoe Bay mean anything to anybody? Anyhow, Prudhoe Bay is the dominant city. I use that tame term loosely about city. It is basically where all the oil and gas workers live. It is like a city you've never been. 
So uh, you wouldn't want a vacation there, but that is a real city and Alaska Airlines lands there and you could drive from Prudhoe Bay to uh, Alictok. And the roadway that gets us there is this close to being washed out. So the purpose of the alternative analysis was what is the most cost effective way to mitigate the risk and ensure continuous use of the installation, right? They know that they could spend a lot of money, but will it give them the bang for the buck? And the truth is, we don't have that kind of money to protect all these facilities. So we did, we, we did an analysis and we picked the LICTOC as the poster child. And then they said, okay, to give us 30 years, what's the best way to mitigate that? What's the best way to co build a resilient infrastructure? So we said, we need to evaluate the dominant mechanisms. You know, you just, with, for years, what the Corps of Engineers did and others, they just put big rock, big revetments. I mean, they called it more elegant terms, but it was basically placing large boulders in front of a plant. Well, it's just like the bags. If you're getting overtopping and then the, you're getting melt around, you're going to get scour, and you're, that, that facility isn't going to last you 30 years. It's going to last you five years. So we wanted to take into account all these variables and come up with, with, with a, um, a, a return on investment analysis that said to them, listen, for 10 years, you spend this much. You spend this much to get 10 years of protection. You spend this much for 20 years, you get this much for 30. And are there a couple of different ways to look at that and not only give us the capital cost, but the O&M cost. And that's what all your clients will want, is that kind of ability to have options that are prudently laid out. In this case, the variable was duration versus cost. So this is the, where we're underway. We're uh, just, we haven't even started this phase. I want to be clear. This is what we're proposing, is to come up with a design uh, that controls for the dominant mechanisms, uh, takes into account the modeling data, and we're just publishing the first round of results we're using the semi-empirical, the, the easier model. Uh, to drive the design. And then we're going to rank various solutions, both structural and non-structural. So these are structural solutions. Uh, the truth is these are mainly pictures from Louisiana. Uh, I said Ken was from Baton Rouge. So, uh, but, so these aren't exactly the structures we'll be building in the Arctic. A couple of them are. Uh, but these are basically your typical marine structures. The difference is, if you're building in Arctic Alaska, one of the things you will evaluate, what we will evaluate, is freezing the subsurface base. There have been schools built in the, in the Arctic in which they freeze the piles uh, using nitrogen, and they keep it frozen, but it's energy intensive and it's expensive up there. Even though you think they got all that oil and gas up there, it is expensive to drive it. But that is one of the more permanent and more elegant solutions. And that may be the case. We may build a near shore structure and freeze the beams into place and, and make sure that that temperature gets maintained. Because temperature, uh, in addition to wave action, is a dominant impact. You have to address both. In addition, we're going to look at relocation. This is something we've looked at in Louisiana. It's something we've looked at for New Jersey Transit right up here. There are certain facilities that just can't be made resilient. They've got to be moved or elevated or relocated. We will probably look at a combination of built structures in addition to relocating the sewer outfall. I have a feeling Mother Nature will take care of the sewer outfall before we get to the, the build. Uh, and we're going to probably relocate the road. But we're not here to predetermine our solution. But my gut feel is that's what we're going to land up doing. So our goal is to give our client a range of alternatives, either singular, you know, the, the concrete mattress on its own, the rock dike on its own, or a combination of relocation with a revetment. So, we, we, but we haven't undertaken this analysis yet. This will be in 2019. Okay, this is what clients love to see. They like to see graphs with dollar signs and some return on investment. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're briefing an executive or a general, just give them something like this. Uh, but essentially, you obviously got to have the science and the engineering to back it up. But our goal is to give them a range of alternatives, taking in the capital cost as well as the O&M cost, and say, this is the amount of time of protection we can give you. 
the total all net present value cost of the solution. And now you've got to make a decision. And based on that decision, we'll come up with the design, the, the design of that preferred solution and put it out to bid for construction. So just to have that, and I think it's referred to above the red line, the preferred is the event horizon, efficient horizon. I'm not actually that familiar with that term of art. Um, but you pick the alternative from that. That's what they're prepared to do. They will be making that decision once we finish the study. And then the second task is, okay, we're going to do a relocation of the roadway. We're going to relocate the sanitary outfall. And we're going to build a rock revetment. And then you'd put that out to bid. But now you have a good design spec, right? You're not only building something uh, that should work from a general typical engineering practice, but it should give you a set amount of time, a performance standard to build to. And that is our aim. Our aim is to give the Air Force a solid design that will give them a guaranteed amount of protection even as the climate changes and these variables change. That's key to all infrastructure building in, in this new environment. As you see, whether it's from Florence or from Katrina, uh, we are really living in a very dynamic environment and anybody doing sustainability must take into account climate impacts and in, in, in whether it's in the supply chain or in the built infrastructure. It is a truly real time, not a long term down the road, but a real time impact right now. I will, I will end my proselytizing at this point. Uh, then at phase four we build and we can't wait to actually build something. A lot of times in our work, we're either cleaning up or demolishing. So it's gonna be pretty cool to actually build something in about 2022, I hope. And uh, so our conclusions are that the erosion is obviously accelerating, that the historic way of predicting it is no longer accurate, effective, or useful that numerical modeling can greatly improve the precision of measuring the vulnerability to these assets over the next 30 to 50 years, that you can use data from that to come up with a good design that will give them the performance metrics that they need to meet, and it could be applied, well, this is what we told the commander, it could be applied at these facilities. The ultimate goal for the DOD was to have this, this model and this approach applied to all Arctic infrastructure, not only for the military, but for the native communities. These native communities are facing some incredibly draconian times. They're already relocating one, one village, 3,000 people inland. Think about if you had to just pick up and move. And, and, and these are people who live off on the land, right? It's not, they're not interbased livelihoods, you know, and now all of a sudden you've got to move miles. Think, just think about that. It's pretty profound. And there are hundreds of those communities that are susceptible to this impact. And when you're up there meeting with these people, it, it has a, it, it's, it's palpable. Well, not bad. 550. I think we did good. Good job. <laughs>